Hello and welcome to episode number 15 of CS350 Online. I'm your host as always, Leslie Eisted, and in today's episode, a brand new topic. And one of my favorite topics, and that is the topic of scheduling. But first, I'd like to check in and make sure that you're working hard on assignment two. And if you do need any help, don't be afraid to, of course, post to Piazza. And if you'd like some help from me specifically, the easiest thing that you can do is to actually take a screenshot of the bug that you're seeing. Not from GDB. I don't want to see your GDB output. I mean the actual bug from OS 161. Take a screenshot of that. Send me that. And then I will tell you what files I need to see because it's probably one of the 20 common bugs that most students encounter. So... Send me an email with that, and that's usually the easiest way for me to help you, and I will try to get back to you as quickly as I can. I'm still catching up from some weekend emails. Um, so do make sure you get going on assignment two. That's really all there is to talk about, I suppose. Other than, of course, the OS of the day. Now, this one has a special place in my heart. Uh, the Sun OS and Solaris. Um, technically, I suppose they're the same operating system, but it was around the... I can't remember if it was in the late 90s or early 2000s where they changed from calling the operating system SunOS to Solaris, but it, it's roughly around that time. This is an operating system that was massively, massively popular, and it was released in 1982 from Sun Microsystems. Um, and there's lots and lots of people who are huge fans of Sun. Um, unfortunately, Sun doesn't exist anymore. So just a little bit about the operating system. So Solaris was actually a closed source distribution of uh, BSD. Um, so yeah, like it wasn't an open source thing where you could actually patch. Um, and it had a desktop GUI since about 1983. And the graphics were actually pretty good for 1983, which is why companies like Lucasfilm were actually using Solaris as their operating system. Well, it would have been SunOS then for uh, doing non-linear editing, so like digital editing. Yes, people did digital editing back in the early 80s. Um, move, some of the, uh, like Return of the Jedi would have had some digital editing done on it. There's a little bit of CG actually even in A New Hope, um, the targeting computer. Not very much. But like also looking at like the early Terminator films, like yeah, there's there's some computer graphics in there. Anyways, that's a topic for another day. Um, so what was SunOS really known for? So obviously because it's based off of Unix and BSD, you're getting, you know, different rings of security, you're getting things treated as files, you're also getting time sharing via preemption, multi-user support, portability, and all those other lovely, lovely things. Okay, well, Solaris wasn't that portable, I'm not going to lie. Um, it's actually quite hard to get Solaris to run on non-Sun hardware. It can be done, but it's not that easy. Um, what they were really known for, though, was... Um, from their operating systems perspective was their, their file system, but not even really their file system. It was their networking support. They had amazing networking support in, in SunOS and Solaris. And I mean, if you actually look at what Sun stands for, it doesn't mean, you know, the sun in the sky. It's Stanford University Network because this was actually a startup out of the Stanford University. This was a company that was trying to develop a lot of networking uh, technology. Um, now, what made Sun so popular? Why did everybody use this? And by the way, when I was an undergrad at Waterloo, we used Solaris. So I think my first year we were still using Sun OS, like 5.6. And you're talking like this was 20 years ago, so I don't even really remember. And then probably in my second year, we switched over to Solaris. So yeah, I mean, we didn't even use GNU Linux on, on the school servers. They were all Sun. All the hardware was Sun. All the operating systems were Sun. Everything was Sun. But why did it gain such popularity? Sun was the first to market with a 64-bit processor, and that is the Spark processor. So the 64-bit architecture from Sun was released in 93. So that had 64-bit addressing, 64-bit integers, and obviously they made Solaris to actually support the 64-bit architecture so the virtual memory could actually use like 48 bits. And this was a really big deal at the time because a lot of the other hardware manufacturing companies were like, 
well, nobody really needs 64 bits, and it's going to be a lot of an investment to to make a 64 bit CPU, and it's it's going to be a lot of investment on the software side. I mean, people were trying to do it, but not as aggressively as Sun. And Sun realized that a lot of you know research facilities were running out of 32 bit space at this point. So they were like, we've got to get this market. They got it to market first. And so it became exceptionally popular and everybody had Sun um, hardware. Now, why don't they exist anymore? This company was huge, um, like really, really big. And I'm, I'm talking like Intel, IBM, Microsoft, Google big. It's a, it was a huge company. Why is it dead? So I actually did work at Sun, which might be part of the reason why I have a bit of a yay Sun feeling. Um, which is actually quite common around people who worked with Sun. We have this deep love for a company that no longer exists, and, and we, we're always friends with each other. Oh, hey, you worked at Sun. Great. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It was a good place to work. But um, why did it die? So I was there in 2003, and when I was there in 2003, was it 2003? I think. Hmm, I don't remember. <laughs> Anyways, they actually laid off 10,000 people. And... What happened was Sun had their own hardware. They had the Spark hardware and it was expensive. It was really, really expensive. It was powerful, but at that point in time, something else was happening with consumer architecture. People realized that they could go to their local Canada computers or Fry's, which is apparently now bankrupt as of like last week, um, and you could buy a bunch of consumer grade hardware and you could stick it all together and you could make for less money a faster server. For less money, you didn't have to pay for special support from Sun to support their special hardware. You didn't have to buy the special OS to run on the special hardware because you could just run Linux or you could run Windows and it would run on this consumer grade hardware. And if you needed to repair or something broke down, it was cheap because it was just consumer grade hardware. You go back out to the store, you pay a couple hundred bucks to replace whatever part broke. And at in the, the early 2000s, Sun was up against this. People starting to realize that, oh, wait a minute, it's actually cheaper to just throw a bunch of consumer grade stuff together. and. So in like around between 2003 and I want to say 2005, they started trying to experiment with, you know, just regular AMD hardware. Like, let's make our servers out of regular hardware and we can release them for cheaper and maybe people will buy that. But it didn't really take off, I want to say. And at the end of the day, they just, they ended up dying. So it was 2010 officially when um, January of 27th of 2010, when they actually uh, became defunct. The remains of Sun was actually acquired by Oracle. And so a lot of the people I used to work with at Sun are now working at Oracle. So my old Sun office in Toronto is now an Oracle office. Um, so yeah, that's what happened to them. But they are very famous for many of the things that you have today. So, for example, if any of you have ever done Java programming, you can thank Sun for that, actually, because they're the people that actually created Java. Um, and if you want to know some interesting stories about that, you should talk to Peter Beer, <laughs> uh, because he has some interesting stories about that. But yeah, there you go. Solaris operating system. Actually, if you want to know a fun story, some things that I would love to get my hands on is Sun actually released for a very short period of time Spark laptops. I want one. <laughs> and it's, it's just for historical reasons because, I, I mean, it's not really a useful computer, but it, it's just it's a rare piece of hardware to get one that actually works. Um, which is kind of fun to collect things like that. All right. So... We are not going to recap anything because it's a new topic. So let's uh, dive into our new topic then. So if you are following along with the course notes, what you want to follow along with is the scheduling notes, which apparently I was on the wrong slide. Okay, there we go. So this is a topic that we've completely avoided talking about for the last two months, and that is how do you actually choose which thread goes next on a context switch? 
because you know that context switches happen for a variety of reasons. One can be the thread called yield voluntarily. One can be the thread actually terminated or the thread could be blocking or it might get preempted. So there's four major reasons why you might have a context switch and need to choose another thread to go next. But at no point have we ever said how you choose which thread goes next. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today is how do you choose the thread that goes next? So let's actually look at that. So first we're going to take things back to about the 1950s. Um, and we're going to talk about things in terms not of threads, but jobs, because that's kind of how things were created back in the 50s as jobs or tasks that we need to run. So we're going to make the assumption for now that we only have a single CPU that can run a single thread. We will talk about scheduling for multi-core CPUs at the very end of this section. But for now, we're going to assume one CPU with one core that can only run one thread. So the total threads or jobs is one. Now, for each of the jobs that we need to schedule, we're going to know a couple pieces of information. One is what time the job arrives at. And two, we're going to know how long the job runs for. And then we've got these two timing mechanisms. Um, time calculations that we have. We have the response time, which is how long does it take between when the job arrives and when the job starts to run? And then you have the turnaround time, which is how long it takes between the job arrives and when the job finishes. So response time is actually included in the turnaround time. So we have to, to create some algorithms and they have to be actually quite efficient because remember context switches actually happen multiple times per second potentially. And what we want is to make sure that whatever algorithm we are using to choose the next job to run um, is fast. And we also want to try to minimize either the average turnaround time or the average response time. Now, why would we want to minimize those things? Because we want the jobs to go through the computer as fast as possible. So we don't want to have to wait a really long time for our job to actually run. So if our job arrives right now, it would be really nice if it ran today and not a month from now. And believe me, there are some algorithms where it may not even run a month from now. So let's look at some really basic algorithms. The first one is first come, first served. And this should be very, very obvious. Now, what's interesting is this doesn't actually minimize anything. It doesn't minimize uh, the uh, response time, and it doesn't actually minimize the turnaround time either. But what first come first serve is, is very fair, very, very fair. And what it also is, is it doesn't have starvation. Now, what does starvation actually means? Starvation would be a job arrives and for whatever reason, it just never gets selected to run. And keep in mind, jobs are constantly arriving. And it's just that old job just never gets chosen. So that job is getting starved. We don't want that to happen. That's really bad, actually. So first come, first serve is very simple to implement and has no starvation because jobs are going to be served in the order in which they arrive. So we're using these Gantt charts here to actually show you how this works. So what we've got is uh, three jobs. And we're going to assume that they arrived in the order of one, two, three. And we're going to have a ready queue. And then what happens here is that um, at time zero, I have to choose between job one, job two, job three. Well, since job one arrived first, we're going to assume that, we're, it goes first. And it runs to completion, and then job two goes. And while job two is running, job four arrives. It goes to the back of the line to wait its turn. Job two goes, then job three, then job four. So first come, first serve is, is really simple. It's really nice because there's no starvation. It's very fair. We are guaranteeing that you are going to go in the order in which you arrived. That's a very fair approach to doing things. But it doesn't actually take into consideration preemption. So we should probably do that. So you can actually add preemption to first come, first served, and it get, becomes round robin scheduling. And this is actually the scheduling algorithm that OS161 uses. So how does it actually work? So what I'd like to do is I'm actually going to um, go through this so you can actually trace this behavior on in a, a notebook here. So let's do this. We'll have it open so you can see the chart and then I will draw things out here. 
So first off, we are going to make the assumption that preemption happens for this scheduling algorithm after every two units. And we don't know what those two units are. We just know it happens every two units. Okay. So what we're going to have is, I don't want blue, I want black. Okay. At time zero, we have this ready queue. And we're going to specifically call it a ready queue here because it's first come, first served. So we're always going to take from the front and add to the back. So that's why we're going to call this a ready queue. So at time zero, and with each job, I'm going to put how much time it has left before completion. So we've got job one, which has five units left to completion, job two, which has eight units left to completion, and job three, which has three units left to completion. And I need to choose one of these jobs to run. Now, since this is first come first served based, we are always going to choose the first job to run. And it is going to get preempted at time two because that is our scheduling quantum. And when you get preempted, you go to the back of the line. So at time two, my ready queue looks like this. And we're going to update the leftover runtime to indicate how long we ran for. So then we choose from the front again. And it goes to time four where it gets preempted. And at time four, my ready queue looks like this. That's pretty cool. And so I'm going to choose job three, which is the new front of the line, to go first, to go. And again, when you get preempted, you go to the back of the line. If you yield, you go to the back of the line. If you're new, you go to the back of the line. Now, something interesting happens at time five. There's no preemption at time five, but at time five, a new job arrives. And my ready pool looks like this. And we're going to add the new job to the back of the line, like that. But we don't need to choose a new job to run because the quantum for job three hasn't expired yet. We're just, with this note, showing that new job arrived. All right. Then at time six, job three gets preempted and our ready queue looks like this. Job three goes to the back of the line with its updated runtime, and now job one gets to run. So now we go to time, it's going to run until time eight, where it gets preempted. And there we go. So now we're going to choose job two to go. Who goes now? Of course, I should have known better than to scroll. So then we go to time 10. I'm going to start putting these closer together because I can't actually scroll right now. So at time 10, we have job four, job three, job one, and job two updated. So finally, we get to run job four. So that's pretty cool. It is going to terminate, not be preempted at time 12. And then we are going to have to choose from one of the following. We're going to choose job three. And it terminates one unit later. So then we choose job one. And then job one terminates at time 14, where we're left with job two and four units left. So job two goes. It's going to get preempted at time 16, but what's interesting is because there won't be any other jobs in the queue, we'll end up choosing job two again, and so job two will run for four units kind of back to back. 
Okay, so we have a question on Twitch here, and it is how much time does it take to preempt, switch the job, and update the ready queue? Is it negligible? For the purposes of our discussion on scheduling, we are going to assume that the time it takes to actually perform the preemption, choose the next job, and do the switch, we're going to assume it's negligible. Um, we are going to assume that it's essentially free. In reality, that's not the case. It does take time to perform that, but usually compared to the length of time that we actually ran for, it's very, very small. So we're going to assume it's negligible, like zero for this. We're going to assume it's instant. <laughs> All right. So that's how OS 161's scheduling algorithm works. So what's nice about this algorithm? It's very easy to implement. Very, very easy. What's also nice about this is because we are switching between the threads still rapidly because we have preemption, the threads are all, or the jobs are all going to make progress at the same time. So it's going to appear as if all the jobs are making progress at the same time, even though only one job is technically running in, 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 any, in any time slot. Round robin, very easy, very nice. It's very, very fair, no starvation, but can we do better? Can we be a bit more intelligent? So what if we did try to minimize something like turnaround time? There is a scheduling algorithm called shortest job first. And the idea is we want to run the smallest jobs first. And the way to think about this is if you go to a grocery store, and I know most of you may not have been to a grocery store in a year. I know my family has not. We've been using delivery services and curbside pickup. But once upon a time, people used to go to grocery stores. And... Um, there's kind of these rules of etiquette at a cashier's line. And the, the etiquette is that if you show up to the checkout with two grocery carts for full of ramen noodles and somebody comes behind you and they have a loaf of bread because they have one item to check out and you have about 300, you let them go in front of you because that's just courtesy. So that's kind of how shorts job first goes. So instead of having a ready queue, we have a ready pool. And we keep track of how long each thread is going to actually run for. So at time zero, instead of choosing job one, which is the first job to arrive, I'm going to choose the shortest of the available jobs in the pool at time one, at time zero. And the shortest job is actually job three. So job three goes first. And then when I look at when job three is done, it's completed, then I say, of oh, job two and job one, which one is shorter? Well, job one is shorter, so I let it go. And while job one is running, a new job arrived, and that was job four. And then when job one is done running, I have to choose between job two and job four to see who goes next. Well, obviously, job four is shorter than job two, so we're going to choose job four. So it does minimize turnaround time because if you look at, on average we are going to be minimizing how long it takes between the job's arrival time and when it actually completes running. But starvation is possible. In this little example here, we keep pushing back the execution of job two until all of the other shorter jobs have gone. But there's, there's only four jobs in total, so it's not really a big deal. And the thing that you're neglecting here is that jobs are continuously arriving. And most jobs are very small. Very short, very small. And big jobs are few and far between. So what's going to end up happening here is, in reality, if you're at the grocery store and you've got your two big carts of ramen noodles, most people don't have two grocery carts full of food. Unless it's like Costco on like Black Friday or something. Most people don't have that much items to actually check out. So what you're going to end up doing is, you know, somebody shows up with a loaf of bread, you let them in front of you. And then somebody else shows up with, with milk and some carrots and you let them in front of you because it's still less than what you have. And if somebody shows up with a full cart, it's still less than your two carts. So you're going to let them in front of you. And what ends up happening is all of most of the jobs that are arriving are smaller than you. So you let them in front of you and do you end up starving to death with two carts of ramen in a grocery store? 
So while shortest job first, you know, it does minimize turnaround time, it also has this big starvation problem. So maybe we can use some kind of preemption in here to try to solve that. And that's where we get shortest remaining time first. Now, shortest remaining time first can be implemented in a number of different ways. You can use the scheduling quantum, but we are not going to use the scheduling quantum. What we are going to do is we are going to always choose the job that has the smallest remaining time to go next. And preemption is going to happen when jobs arrive. So if a job arrives, it will cause the current running job to be preempted. And then we will choose from the ready pool who now has the shortest remaining time. So let's actually go through this one just like we did with uh, round robin so you can see how it works. And I have a feeling that I'm going to have to shut one note down in order to make this work. I did, by the way, try some of the other notebook programs that people uh, told me about and they were similarly buggy. Actually, it was mostly that they were laggy with my pen and I didn't like that. So there you go. Stuck with one note for now. All right. So again, we're going to have a ready pool instead of a ready queue. And we're going to keep track with each job how much remaining time it has. So this is our ready pool. So at time zero, we have job one, which has five units, job two, which has eight, and job three, which has three units. So we are going to choose the one with the shortest remaining time. Guess what? That's job three. Now, no jobs arrive while job three is running. So this is actually going to run to completion. And then at time three, we have job one to choose from and job two to choose from. So we are actually going to choose job one. At time five, a new job arrives. And my ready queue will ready pew pool will look like this. And now I have to reevaluate and figure out who now has the shortest remaining time. Now obviously that is going to be the third job that just arrived, which is of course job four. So we choose job four to go next. Job four finishes at time seven. So at time seven we have the following jobs. So job one gets to run again. And it's going to run to time 10. And at time 10, all we have left is job two. So it gets to run. And it runs to completion because there's no other threat jobs to, to choose from. So yeah, we do have a little bit of you know switching between threads and a little bit of context switching happening here but it's not really any better than the previous one. There's still starvation possible. There would be a lot more thread switching. Like you would be doing a lot more context switching in a real environment because jobs would be continuously arriving, but you still get starvation. So this isn't that great either. And by the way, you actually get the same Gantt chart if you do preemption according to the scheduling quantum. So that doesn't really help either. Now, the truth is there's actually more problems with what we've just done than what I just told you about. Um, so first off, we don't call things jobs. We call them threads. Secondly, do you know how long a job's going to run for? I don't. Like, I can sit down and I can say, I'm only going to play Zelda for, you know, half an hour. And 16 hours later, still playing. And the same is true for a lot of people. You know, they sit down and they might set a timer that says, okay, I'm allowed to play this video game for 15 minutes. I'll just play one round. And then you finish the round and then you keep playing. So if you don't know how long you're going to run the program for, how on earth does the computer know? I mean, you could create some kind of like machine learning algorithm that looks at the behavior across everybody who uses the program and it makes some kind of intelligent guess. It seems like an awful lot of work for scheduling. My understanding is people have tried to do something like that. But again, that's going to be a very expensive scheduler. We want our scheduler to be very cheap. But 
there's actually something else really interesting. How long it takes for a program to run really depends on what architecture, what hardware you're running it on. And it also depends on what else you're running at the same time. What is the US doing at the same time? What other software is running? So for example, when I was in like grade seven or eight, every classroom had a, com a couple of Commodore 64 computers. And we were learning to program in basic. And so we wrote a little basic program to print the numbers from one to a million onto the screen. And it took 12 and a half hours to do it. 12 and a half hours. You can write a C or C++ program right now to do this exact same task and it'll take less than two minutes. But it's the same program. I could even do it in basic on this computer and it would still only take a couple minutes. It wouldn't take 12 and a half hours. And even though it's the same technical program, the difference is hardware. Commodore 64s aren't exactly fast computers. And I mean, if you want to know the difference, let me just uh, Google that here. I don't actually know how fast they were. I'm guessing they weren't that fast. They were 8-bit computers. Yes, 8-bit. You heard that correctly. Not 16-bit, not 32-bit. 8-bit computers. And their CPU ran at 1.023 megahertz. 1 <laughs> megahertz. <laughs> and my current machine, I have a Core i9. That's like approximating three gigahertz. It's just silly. Plus I have like six cores and each of those has like a hyper thread of two. So you can see there's a pretty big difference in hardware there. But what's even more interesting is that I could run the same program on my computer over and over and over again. And each time I run it, I get a different value. So if I go over here to a terminal and I don't think that's the terminal I want. I think this is the terminal I want. And I think it's timing. Let's try it. Yeah, that's the one. So we're going to run this program called timing. And we're going to see how long it takes to run. And I know it's going to take a few seconds. But I want you to make note of the fact that when I run this program back to back, I have not changed anything else on my computer. So I ran it once, and now I'm going to run it again. Back-to-back -back execution of the same program with no other changes by me to my computer. And if you look at how long it took to run, you'll see it's different. And in fact, every time that I run it, it's going to be different. Now, if you're wondering what all these numbers are, real is how much time you experienced user is how much time was spent executing in user mode and sys is how much time was spent executing in kernel privilege i.e. how much of the kernel was actually running during that time and it is possible that user plus system is not equal to real in fact it can be more than and that that's normal um, don't worry about that so here's the thing you don't know how long you're going to run a program for how long a program takes to run really depends on the architecture, the, what are you running it on, but it also depends on what is your computer doing. So in all of these scheduling algorithms, we made the assumption that we knew how long a job was going to run for. We don't know that. that. That's not something we actually know reliably. So we can't really use scheduling algorithms that require that information. That just doesn't make sense. Something else that these scheduling algorithms have really failed to consider is the fact that threads can yield, threads can be blocked, and how do you handle that? If a thread becomes blocked, well, for first come, first serve and round robin, it's obvious. Anytime a thread gets context switched out for any reason, it goes to the back of the line. But one thing that first come, first serve doesn't take into consideration, and neither do the other ones, shortest job first or shortest remaining time first, they don't take into consideration priorities. Not every thread on your system has the same priority. For example, if I'm playing a game like Unreal Tournament, which is one of my all-time favorites, 
Not the newer versions. I mean the 1999 version that you don't even have to install. <laughs> Old fashioned Unreal. And if I'm trying to play that game, that is going to be a very high priority thread. Why? Because it's interactive. Because there's graphics, there's so many things happening. It's a very interactive, very high priority thread. But if I am doing a backup to my one of my servers downstairs, that is not a very high priority thread. I'm not actively interacting with it. It's sitting in the background. So I don't really care if it gets the biggest allocation of CPU resources per unit of time. So how do you actually create scheduling algorithms that take that into consideration priority as part of their implementation? So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to look at two real world scheduling algorithms. We're going to look at them from a very high level because they're each operating system and each operating system's implementation of it they have so many subtle details. So we're going to introduce you to the high level ideas. And then if you're interested in looking at, okay, how does specifically Windows do this? You're welcome to do a deep dive on that. And you'll have at least a basic understanding of what's happening at a higher level. So first we're going to look at one called multi-level feedback cues and this or MLFQ. This is actually probably the most commonly used scheduling algorithm out there. Um, Windows uses it. Mac OS uses it, Solaris used it, uh, I think BSD uses it, um, one, Linux used to use it, but my understanding is um, they moved away from MLFQ to their own scheduling algorithm and we'll talk about it in a few minutes. Um, but yes, MLFQ, one of the most popular scheduling algorithms out there. So the idea is that they've considered priority to be with respect to how interactive a thread is. And an interactive thread is a thread that is frequently blocking to wait for user input or packets from a network or something like that. So interactive with respect to waiting for something to happen. And we wanna give priority to the threads that are waiting for something to happen because when the something happens, we want that thread to be very responsive to the fact that the something happened. For example, if I'm playing Unreal Tournament and I, you know, fire my flat cannon, I want to make sure that that actually happens immediately. Like I push the button to fire. I want to make sure that it actually happens right then. I want the game to respond to my interaction immediately because there's nothing worse than having a lag in a game, especially a first person shooter game. Okay, let's be honest, lag in any game sucks. And I remember playing Warcraft 3 on the first um, of my Athlon 800 and I would get like one frame per minute. That's how I knew it was time to build a new computer. Solely because Warcraft 3 was not playing very good. All right, so what we're going to do is we need to give higher priority to interactive threads, but how do you know a thread is going to be interactive? That's an interesting question. So this is what happens. The multi-level feedback cues is actually going to be able to separate interactive threads from non-interactive threads through this clever trickle down system they have. So instead of having one ready queue, they actually have N ready queues. The highest priority queue is the top. That's QN. And threads in Q, what's interesting is that threads in each queue actually have a different scheduling quantum. So if you are in the highest priority queue, you will have the shortest scheduling quantum. And Q1 has the lowest priority and has the longest scheduling quantum. And what's going to happen is every thread starts out by being added into the highest priority queue. The idea is that if you get preempted, you weren't very interactive. So instead of being pushed back onto the highest priority queue, you will trickle down to the next highest priority queue. And if you get preempted from there, you will trickle down all the way down to the bottom. The idea is highly interactive threads will block or terminate before that short scheduling quantum expires 
And when you are blocked and you wake back up, you always go to the highest priority queue. So the high priority most interactive threads will stay up here, and threads that are less interactive will trickle down. When we choose a thread to go next, we're always going to choose from the highest priority queue that has threads. So if there are threads in QN, we will choose from QN. If there's no threads in QN, only then do we look at QN minus one. If it's empty, then QN minus two. And only if everything above it is empty do we look at the threads down at the bottom in the lowest priority. This way, we are always servicing the high priority highly interactive threads before the less interactive threads, like my ray tracer, which is just sitting there multiplying matrices. So here's a little example with just three cues. So what's going to happen is all new threads start at the top, the highest priority. They'll get selected to run if on a context switch, if there's any available. And if they get preempted, they trickle down. If, however, they block, they go up into a block state, and when they wake, they trickle back into the highest priority queue to make sure we are being very responsive to threads that um, have resources that have just become available. When you reach the bottom, obviously there's no queue below you, so you're just going to keep going on to the back of that queue. Excuse me. Now, what else is going to happen here is... If a lower priority thread is running and a higher priority thread arrives, we will preempt the, the running thread in favor of letting the higher priority thread run. So keep that in mind. So if a Q1 thread is running and a Q3 thread arrives, then we stop the Q1 thread, do a context switch to the higher priority thread. Now, there is a problem with this method, and the problem is starvation. Because threads like a ray tracer, which just do computation without actually blocking ever, they're going to trickle down to the bottom queue. And if you're trying to watch a movie at the same time or play a video game at the same time, they would actually get 100% of the CPU resources, but your ray tracer would get nothing because there's a higher priority thread in the system, so it would always get chosen. We have starvation here. So the solution to the starvation is to actually periodically take every thread in the system and put it back into the highest priority um, queue. So you start at the top, you trickle down, and then periodically we take everybody back up to the top to trickle down again. Back up to the top, trickle down again. So it's actually kind of an interesting system, right? Now, this, as I said, has actually been used um, in real operating systems. So for example, Solaris, since we've been talking about Solaris today already, had six levels. The highest priority queue had a quantum of 40 milliseconds and the lowest uh, priority queue had 200 milliseconds. Um, and then once per second, all threads were bumped um, back up to the top. So every second, everybody got back to the top. To trickle down again. So that's pretty cool, right? And Windows used to have, once upon a time, Windows had like four and then they had six. And now I think Windows has about 10 queues. And you can actually give preference to, so, so Windows' implementation of this lets you actually assign a priority to threads. And I'm not sure how they are implementing it because Windows code obviously is not open source. But how I would implement that is I would say, okay, we are just going to prevent that thread from going below that queue. So there's different ways that you could implement things like that. So the highest priority would always stay in highest priority regardless of preemptions. Um, and then it, let's say you had a medium priority, it would never fall to low priority. So th there's different ways that you could implement things like that. It really depends on what you're doing. So let's do a little example here. So let's suppose you have two threads and they both start in Q3. We select Q or T1 to run, and if T1 gets preempted, it goes down to Q2, and then we take always from the highest priority Q that has something to run, so T2 gets to run. While T2 is running, a new thread arrives, but since it is equal in priority, it's not going to preempt. T2 terminates, 
Since there is still something in a higher priority queue than T1, we're going to run T3. If T3 blocks, since there would be nothing in Q3, then and only then do we look at Q2. So T1 finally gets to run. T1 gets preempted, so it shifts down. And since there's nothing above it, T1's going to get selected again. Now, let's suppose that T1 actually wakes up T3. T3 goes into the ready pool for Q3. And because that's a higher priority, it causes a context switch. T1 goes back back into the back of Q1. T3 is now the highest priority thread, so it gets to run. So T3 waking is going to preempt T1 that was running. Why is this good? Because something just happened in the system that's going to let T3 continue. It would be really nice if T3 got to do that and continue with that new value right away instead of forcing it to wait. And then T3 runs. And then we go on. So there's a little example of that. So that's multi-level feedback cues. It's a very, very high level description of it. We, as I said, each particular operating system and even versions of the operating systems do their own little twist on it. But now you get the high level idea of how it works. So now I want to talk about Linux's completely fair scheduler. And there's a lovely paper about this. It involves red, black trees and things like that. We're just going to talk about the high level idea. And if you want to read the paper about this, you're more than welcome to do that. And I really should post those papers. So with multi-level feedback cues, you notice that depending on your priority, you had a different schedule in quantum. With CFS, everybody has the same schedule in quantum. So instead of having different scheduling quantums, we have just one. What we're going to do is assign every thread a weight. And by the way, you can actually do this with the nice command in, in Linux and in, on a Unix system. Nice can actually assign like a weight or a priority to each of your different processes. So that's kind of useful. And what the idea is, you are going to get a proportion of the CPU's time uh, according to your weight. So your fair share of the processor is, is proportional to your weight. Higher weight threads get more of the CPU's time than lower weight threads. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this thing called the virtual runtime. And the virtual runtime is going to keep track of how long the thread has actually run for, along with what is the proportional weight of this thread in the system? What is this thread's fair how much of the CPU's time is this thread supposed to be taking compared to everybody else? What proportion should it be getting? And we're going to compute this thing called the virtual runtime. And I'll show you the formula here in a minute. And the idea is we're always on a context switch going to choose the thread with the smallest virtual runtime. And the idea is that high weight threads are going to have their virtual runtimes advance more slowly than low weight threads. We'll show you an example here in a minute. And that way, high weight threads get chosen more often than low weight threads. And you might think, oh, well, that will mean there's starvation. Well, no, because there will come a point where high weight threads end up having a higher virtual runtime than the low weight threads. So once we cross that threshold, then the low weight threads get to go. And that will happen because we've restricted the number of weights and so on. So let's actually look at the virtual runtime here. Page. So the virtual runtime is equal to the actual runtime multiplied by the sum of all. Threads weight divided by your weight. Okay? So, for example, if your actual runtime, which is how much time you've actually run ran for, let's say that was five milliseconds, and let's say the sum of all thread weights in the system was. Let's say that was, at this point in time, 100. 
and your weight, let's say, was 20, then this would be 5 times 100 divided by 20. So, of course, 100 over 20 is going to be 5. So this would be a virtual run time of 25. And then we would choose the thread to go next, which had the smallest virtual run time. So there's an example in the notes. We can go through that. It's kind of a fun example. So at time t, we have three threads in the system. The total thread weight of all the threads in the system right now is 50. And all threads have already run for five units of time. So we want to compute the virtual run time for each of these and then choose which thread is going to go next. The answers are actually on the next slide, so let's just switch there and we'll walk you through it. So for the first thread, sorry, this should just be t, not t plus 5. At time t, thread 1's virtual run time is 10. Thread 2's virtual run time is 12.5. And thread 3's virtual run time is 50. So I'm going to choose thread 1 to go next. So then at time t plus 5, assuming a quantum of 5, my virtual or my actual runtime for thread 1 has advanced to 10 because it actually got a chance to run for 5 units. And now its new virtual runtime is 20, whereas threads 2 is still 12.5 and the other one is still 50. And so we are going to choose thread 2 to go next. Now what's interesting is you'll see that the time is going to advance much more slowly for thread 1 than thread 2 or thread 3. Because what's interesting, so let's actually go back out to OneNote here. So if we've got, you know, so here's thread 1 and its weight is 25. And if it's AR, when its AR was 5, its virtual runtime was 10. When it's AR, its actual runtime was 10, its virtual runtime was 20. But let's compare that to thread 3, whose weight is only 5. When its actual runtime is equal to 5, its virtual runtime was 50. If its actual runtime was 10, then we'd end up with 10 times 50 divided by 5. So that is going to be 10. So we'd end up with an actual runtime of 100. So look, we are seeing that we go from 10 to 20 here, but we're going from 50 to 100. Yes, they're both doubling. But since the actual, since the virtual, the weight is bigger for thread one, we are going to advance much more slowly here than with this one. So that's kind of cool. All right. So we don't really go into too great of detail with the Linux Completely Fair Scheduler because there's not much to it. Um, well, I mean, there are lots of details if you actually look at the Linux kernel's implementation. And if you want to know more, please, by all means, read the paper about it. I'll see if I can dig it up and post it. What I'd like to finish this section off, this is one of those one whole module in the episode, so that's kind of a fun thing. What I'd like to finish this section off is talking about how do you do scheduling for multi-core processors? This is actually quite interesting because all of the scheduling algorithms we've talked about so far, we've made the assumption that there are single core CPUs. So how do you handle the case where you have um, multiple cores or multiple CPUs? There are two approaches, two main approaches. It's not to say there aren't others, but these are the two big ones. There's per core ready queues. So you have a scheduler per, per core, or shared ready queue, so one scheduler that all of the cores share. And there are advantages and disadvantages to each method. So I want to talk about the shared ready core example here. So let's say that you have a core, uh, there's a context switch on core zero, and so the scheduler has to run to give you a new thread. But let's say uh, while you are trying to 
get a new thread for core zero, cores one, two, and three also have context switches, and they also need to access to the ready queue in order to actually get their next threads. Well, then we have contention for a shared resource because only one core at a time can access the shared ready queue. So while core zero is getting its new thread, cores one, two, and three have to block and execute nothing while they wait for the context switch on core zero to actually complete. Now that may not seem like a big deal to you when you have only four cores or 12 cores, it's not really that big of a deal because it's such a quick operation. But now let's think about Weta Digital's big render farm. Once upon a time, it was in the top 500 supercomputer list. Yeah, render farm in the top 500 computer, supercomputers list. It's true. I don't think it is anymore though. Okay, you're talking not about 12 processors. You're talking about literally tens of thousands of cores. If one core is getting a new thread and the other 9,999 are locked, blocking, that doesn't make sense. That's a complete waste of time. So what this here, shared ready queue, is actually fairly easy to implement because you have one ready queue, one scheduler. The problem is you have contention for this shared resource. It does not scale well. It doesn't scale well at all. But there's actually another problem with it. So even though it's really easy to implement, one of the other problems that we actually have with shared ready queue is the fact that each time a thread runs, it may run on a completely different core. And maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but remember that cores have caches. And if we don't clear the cache on a context switch, which in reality we don't want to do, we don't want to clear the cache on a context switch, if we don't clear the cache on the context switch, then wouldn't it be nice if we ran on core zero that the next time we ran on core zero too? Because if we did, then there is a chance that some of our cache data is still in core zero's cache, which means that we get a little bit of a performance boost because we still had some data in the cache. We call that cache affinity and the shared ready queue implementations don't really have it because we don't pay attention to what core you did run on to choose which core you're going to run on next. Now, does that mean that per core ready queues are all the, the big deal, that's what we need to do? They are harder to implement. They do not have contention for a shared resource because core zero is always going to be referencing shared the, the ready queue zero. Core one will only have our access ready queue one, core two only accesses ready queue two, and core three is always going to access ready queue three. So there's no shared resource. So it actually scales really well. And another thing you get that's really great is cache affinity. So because these threads always are going to run on this core, the chances that some of their data is still in the cache the next time they run is pretty high. So that's really cool, right? That's really, really cool. So what's the downside? The downside is load balancing. If you look at this simple example here, what you have is you've got this, let's say in one, uh, this is a picture of the CPU for one hour. These two threads here each get 30 minutes of compute time. These threads here get less than 15 minutes a piece. These threads here get 15 minutes. And this thread down on core three gets the whole hour to run. How is that fair? That these threads get like 12 and a half minutes each and this thread here gets an hour. So we have a load balancing problem. And, uh, Actually, what's kind of interesting about this is if you actually look at, I want to see Windows 7, but maybe it was Windows XP. This is a really long time ago for me because I have not actually used a Windows machine as my main computer in a very, very long time. <laughs> but um, if you look at some of the older versions of Windows, when multi-core processors first came out, they actually had a load balancing problem. So you could actually have, like if you had a four core system, and so you could, and like an Intel that you could actually have like eight things running at the same time, you would, even if you were running a lot of jobs on your computer, you would see like the 
first two, like the first core running things at 100%, and then the remaining three cores would be at zero. And so everything would get assigned to core zero, but nothing would get it assigned to core one, two, or three. So there was a serious load balancing problem there. And it was actually hard to write programs to get it to use the other cores. I mean, you could do it, but you had to consciously do it. Windows doesn't have this problem anymore. Um, you can actually see it. You can see it actually balances things out a bit better. But how do you do load balancing? How do you prevent this from happening? Like, how do you make it so that a thread doesn't get added to the core that has everything instead of a core that has nothing. Well, the one thing you could do is when a core, when a, when a new thread enters the system, add it to the core with the smallest queue. So that's one thing that you could do. Another thing that you can do is because that doesn't necessarily balance things out is you could periodically rebalance things. So, so periodically when you you could either do it every time there's a context switch. You could say, okay, I could put this on the back of my queue, but is there a processor where there are less jobs? So you might be switching which core a thread runs on on a context switch. So that's one thing that you could do. Another thing that you could do is periodically, like say once a minute, rebalance the load. So take some threads off one queue and put them onto the other. The downside of balancing the load is, especially if you're rebalancing, is what's going to happen is you're going to lose some of the cache if any. You don't lose all of it, but you are going to lose some of it. And that is how we usually handle things. So now if you're wondering, I know there's two more slides, but it's just talking about all of the things that um, I just mentioned. So that is how we actually handle uh, scheduling on multi-core processors. So that's kind of fun. All right, that is actually the end of the entire scheduling section. Now there is a sample problem in the uh, posted zip file for this. We never actually go over it. You're welcome to take a look at it. The solutions are in one of the old midterms. It's really up to you. It's with respect to multi-level feedback cues. The best thing that you could do is given a pool of jobs with run times, make sure you understand how to choose which one goes next. That's really the best way to practice for this. Make sure that you can compute virtual run times. Uh, make sure that you can also uh, look at a multi-level feedback queue and figure out what thread is going to go next. So that's, that's really what I would say you should do for studying this. And with that, we will start another new topic on Thursday. And on Thursday, it is the exciting topic of devices and I.O. So we're going to actually start talking about how do you interact with devices, like your keyboard and your disk drive. And we'll talk about device drivers. And then we're going to start talking about how do hard drives actually work, because that's kind of interesting. Um, so that will be in episode 16, which is our next episode. So we will see you then. Our high school guidance counselor used to ask us what you would do if you had a million dollars. It didn't have to work. And then invariably, whatever you'd say, that was supposed to be your career. So if you wanted to fix old cars, then you're supposed to be an auto mechanic. So what did you say? I never had an answer. I guess that's why I'm working at Inatech. No, you're working at Inatech because that question is bullshit to begin with. If everyone listened to her, there'd be no janitors because no one would clean shit up if they had a million dollars. You know what I would do if I had a million dollars? I would invest half of it in Doris mutual funds and then take the other half over to my friend Asadullah who works in uh, securities. Samir, Samir, you're missing the point. The point of the exercise is that you're supposed to figure out what you would want to do if... PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean?